Now, as you know, everyone's DNA is unique, except for identical twins, of course. Now, genetic profiling or DNA fingerprinting is a method that allows you to identify someone from their unique DNA code. The result of DNA fingerprinting or genetic profiling will be an image showing a banding pattern, uh, which is unique to that individual. It can be used to see who is present at a crime scene or to confirm if people are related to each other. And the technique was invented in 1984. Uh, and since then, it has been modified and improved and modified and improved um, to a very highly sensitive method that we have today. Now, genes don't actually vary all that much between individuals, especially closely related ones. So it won't be that good if you were to just look at the genes if you wanted to um, really distinguish between two certain individuals. However, the non-coding region of our DNA is highly variable. The bits in between the genes are highly, highly variable. And if we analyze that, then we'll be, we will be able to clearly distinguish between individuals' as DNA. Within the non-coding regions are repeated sections of codes that are called tandem repeats. Now you can have things called variable number tandem repeats or VNTR, which are basically repeats of six bases. So here you've got C, T, A, G, C, C repeated seven times. So that's a variable number tandem repeat. Or you can have even shorter repeats, short tandem repeats, STRs, which are repeats of about between one and six bases long. For example, this one is just a repeat of only two bases, C, A, which has been repeated four times. Now the number of times these repeats happen we found is hugely variable between individuals. So these are the areas that we really want to isolate and to analyze in order to form our genetic profile. Now the first step is actually to isolate the sections of DNA with these repeats in using restriction endonucleases. Now if we've used restriction endonucleases, we mentioned them in the genetic engineering video, and these are enzymes that cut DNA at very specific points. So hopefully we can get the right restriction endonucleases to chop out the areas of the individual's DNA who we want to profile um, to isolate the short tandem repeats. Now at this point, if you've only got a small sample, you're gonna to need to amplify it to be able to visualize the DNA much easier. And anytime you want to amplify DNA samples, you need to use the polymerase chain reaction, PCR, which is explained in the genetic engineering uh, videos on this topic. Now that they've been isolated and amplified, these DNA fragments now need organizing into size. Now this can be done using a technique called gel electrophoresis. So gel electrophoresis is used to separate out DNA fragments according to their length. DNA fragments get loaded into a well in a agarose gel, which is submerged in buffer solution. A current is then passed through the gel. Now DNA is negatively charged and so moves towards the positive electrode. The shorter the DNA fragment, the faster it will move through the gel from the negative to the positive electrode. Now, when you do that, the fragments will separate out according to the length of their base pairs, and it will create the banding pattern. As you can see, some of these bands on this gel electrophoresis match up uh, between the baby at the top and that man at the bottom. And therefore, they have certain parts of their DNA in common, and it's most likely that they are related and this is the father of the baby. So this is an example here where you've got two men and a baby and they're doing a paternity test to see which man is the father. And in this case, it's clearly the bottom uh, man on the diagram here is the father of that baby. How do the bands actually get made visible? Well, if you recall back to the PCR method, you need to add primers at each stage to multiply the DNA. Now what you do is you add special fluorescently tagged primers during PCR um, so that the amplified fragments become visible in the gel. So here's a quick example. Who did the crime? Blood stains were found at a crime scene, which is different from the victim's. So we've got the victim's blood, but there's also a, another type of blood there. And it's been tested, and the profile of that blood is shown there. 
Now, there are three suspects who um, they think may have committed the crime, may have committed the murder. So those three suspects are swabbed, a, their DNA is taken, and it is analysed. And it is clear here that it is the suspect number two, the woman in the middle, their profiles are identical. So she did the crime, well, this is where you've got to be careful, and this is why um, you still have to have a jury and, uh, and a court case, because just because her blood was at the crime scene doesn't necessarily mean that she committed the crime. But what we do know is that that is definitely her blood. So other evidence would need to be looked at before you can necessarily convict her. Uh, the last thing to mention are things called match tables. Now, match tables can be used to see how much DNA you have in common with your relatives. Quite useful to be able to look at the percentage of DNA you'd expect to have in common with your grandfather or with your cousin, for example.